Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the introduction. I'm very sorry, but it's not going to be about metaphysics, but I'm sure you're all happy about that. Thank you for the invitation to the long night of the climate, not least to Werner, who invited me, and of course to the rest of you for coming here to listening or to listen to me speaking about the book that I truly enough wrote with um, Bruno Latour around one and a half year ago, and that is uh, now published in a um, several amounts of languages, um, among them German, called Zur Instehung einer ökologische Klatze. If I'm not wrong, it's always very good with German words because it sounds very serious. But of course, <laughs> the circumstances for today, speaking about me and Bruno's work, is a little bit weird. It's not more than a year ago that he left us, less than a year ago. And of course, Bruno was not only a very dear colleague, he was also a close friend, close to family in the last couple of years of his life. Um, and what I therefore wish to do today in the memory of his, um, of his intellectual capacity, in the memory of his contribution to political ecology, is exactly to, to give a little introduction to the book that we wrote together. Again, in the memory, not only of course, in, uh, in the memory of an incredibly interesting intellectual, I guess many would agree, but also a very warm, a very generous, very funny human being. Um, I remember once, a couple of months after our book came out, he said, he called me and he said, you need to come to this restaurant, are you in the area, we need to speak about something very serious, and he was already sick, so I was of course worried. I come to the restaurant, I sit down, he's sitting there, very serious, look at me and says, I have something to tell you, and I was like, okay, what's up? He says, I realized that we are right, <laughs> and the others are wrong. So then we could have lunch if I wanted to. In any case, I'm completely sure that you would have been com uh, very happy to see not only our arguments floating through, of course, the academic institutions, public debate and so on and so forth, but also to cultural institutions, houses like these, that Bruno certainly understood had an enormous essential role in the composition of a common world. So again, a wonderful human being that I'm happy and proud, of course, to have been worked with. Uh, working with and therefore what I wish to do is to repeat myself give a little introduction to three main points from the book that we wrote together but preceding the first point I wish to say a few introductory words about let's say the context of it so based on a couple of years of collaboration on what me and him has called geo social classes we were writing the book in the um, slipstream or in the period before the French uh, upcoming um, election in the summer of 2021. And what was puzzling us, what was breaking down our minds here in France was that ecology was everywhere and nowhere. What does that mean? Well, on the one hand, ecology is everywhere because every day we are bombarded with catastrophic news warning signs of an earth system that is reacting to how we are inhabiting it. At least in the European political sphere, you can say that the ecological question has long since manifested itself, not only as one, but the political question. So ecology is everywhere. But on the other hand, ecology is nowhere, because with very few exceptions, maybe Germany being one of them, every time there is an election, the political green parties are struggling to even reach over the electoral threshold. In France, as we had expected the Green Party didn't even get 5% of the votes, meaning that they didn't have their campaign subsidized afterwards by the state. And in Denmark, where I'm from, the Green Party was celebrating it as a civilizational victory that they had reached 3% electoral support. So the question is, where does this misalignment, this disconnection, this asymmetry of ethics stem from? Where does it come from? What are the roots of it? How come? that there isn't a catastrophe unfolding in front of our eyes, the attention we do pay to it, and the very little political effects that emerges from the situation, the very little political mobilization that comes from. This is the question that we try to um, address in the book by first diagnosing why these political effects are so stagnated and indicate in the second part of the book how we could potentially get towards a strong ecological movement, a solid political ecology. So in other words, the question is, under what conditions could political ecology, a political ecological ideology, acquire a strength, a consistency, 
and an autonomy that would enable it to compete on equal terms with the old ideologies that continue to define the political landscape. So this is what we investigate in the book, and this is what I'm going to try to speak a little about, about today. Again, three points. If I had a PowerPoint, I'm not very good at PowerPoint, so I always just invent them. If I had a PowerPoint, it would have said, point one, nature does not unite us, nature divides us. Again, the IPCC alarm bells have been ringing for a long time. Every year, not least this year, we see the catastrophe growing in intensity, in scale, in proximity. So why are we not acting? Well, probably because there is not a lot of us who knows who this we actually is. For way too long, we argue, political ecology has been tripping over its own feet, stumbling, so to say, by formulating, articulating, representing its political project as something universal, as something that would automatically, let's say, rally us around a common project. For 50 years, the story, I'm afraid, has always been a little bit the same. Every time an ecologist has opened their mouth, gathered under the flags of Mother Nature, it was expected that we would somehow, one day, all come together when the catastrophe came close enough. From the Friday for Future activists, through the fights against the expansion of an industrial harbor in my home city of Aarhus in Denmark, through Extension Rebellion to the Indian um, farmers fighting, every time there is a political ecological question, the lesson is the same. Nature does not unite us, it divides us. But this is not the Achilles heel, the problem of ecology. Because as we know from social history, actually social conflicts, narratives of conflicts have a lot bigger of a potential of gathering political ethics and mobilization than peace projects have. Peace and harmony makes people yawn. Conflicts make you ready to fight. So the problem is not conflict as such. The problem is rather that political ecology has not managed to identify, represent, articulate and embrace the new ecological conflicts that the climate question, the biodiversity question and so on is making emerge. And that it has not managed to unite them, connect them into a united narrative that can mobilize people for action. So, this is our first point on the PowerPoint. For political ecology to gain a strong ideological consistency, it must accept, embrace, define and represent its political project in terms of conflicts, which can exactly help to create a we, a them, and a vector of history. And of course, a united narrative, unified narrative rather, that can incite political mobilization. The question is, of course, what narrative? Point two, a new class struggle. So, historically, one concept, one narrative, one telltale has been particularly useful in delineating social conflicts, in describing social conflicts, and in inciting political uh, action and constructing ideological consistency, the concept of class. So there's a few things which are important to remember about the concept of class. Class is not one thing. It's never been one narrative. Its meaning has never been chiseled in stone. Instead, the concept of class has had many different meanings attached to it through history. It's an essentially contested concept. More concretely, generation after generation of social scientists have continuously added aspects, nuances, new telltales to what class means as society and its material and cultural infrastructure has changed shape, as injustices has changed and as social struggles have diverted in different directions. So, in a sense, the history of the concept of class can be understood as a history of betrayal. And this is important to keep in mind because it allows us a little bit of freedom in rethinking this notion. But even if the concept of class or the history of the concept of class cl can be understood as a history of betrayal, no matter if we're speaking about the neo-Marxist Max Weber, Bourdieu, and so on and so forth, it can also be understood as a history, a conceptual history of loyalty. Why? Well, 
Because the last 150 years, every time somebody adjusted, nuanced the narrative of class, they always had to go through initial dialogue with or critique of Marx and his narrative of class. So I'm afraid that Friday night you will have to spend a little bit of time on Marx. There's probably few conceptual interventions, inventions during the 20th century that has been as powerful as Marx's narrative of class. And the question is, of course, why this theoretical framework grew as powerful in sociology and in political culture in general. One way to explain this, my way to explain this, which is, of course, the right one, <laughs> is that Marx provided a somewhat precise compass, a map that allowed people to understand how society subsisted, societies subsisted, where in the process of this subsistence, subsistence process people were positioned, what conflicts people engaged in, and in which direction history took. What is important to remember is also that Marx's idea about class was of course always related to an ideal of social transformation. It was never just a descriptive concept, it was a normative concept. It both had to identify, describe a given social structure, thereafter classify people in this social landscape along certain conflictual lines, as you remember, and on the basis hereof, it offered perspectives for political action. His theory was a way of saying, how do societies or collectives reproduce socially and materially? Where in this process are people, again, positioned? Who are their allies? Who are their antagonists? What conflicts are they engaged in? Over what? And again, what is the direction of history? I think here lies the enormous historical importance of Marxism, the Marxist class narrative. He gave us an understanding of how social historical struggles were organized around the means of production against the backdrop of a description of how production reproduced society, how it permitted the continuation of societies. Different classes, as you remember, clashed together in the struggles over either keeping or taking over the means of production. So the map that I spoke about before, which somehow is the strength of class theory. Marx and socialisms afterwards directed their attention to the production forces, right? Society continued to subsist because of production. People lived off its fruits. People were different positioned in a system of production where they clashed together in struggles, battles, conflicts over the means of production that we remember would at a certain moment lead to a revolutionary shift in ownership over the means of production between the proletariat and the capitalist class. But the problem is that by only thinking in terms of production, one can neither today answer how societies continue to subsist or how class interests are changing shape. Because in what Bruno called our new climatic regime, basically an epoch of history marked by climatic disasters, ecological downbreaks, biodiversity crisis, and so on and so forth, we see now, like at the wake of the Industrial Revolution, that the material infrastructure of society is rapidly transformed. History is a strange thing that sometimes dances oddly. And today it has taken a very odd turn that exactly the ecological sciences detected a long time ago, even if they did not manage to make these into political action schemes. The continuation the subsistence of societies is today no longer simply secured by production, but by a longer list of earthly entities that allows processes, that allows the habitability conditions of the earth to keep on going. And what is even more peculiar is not only that I got a new microphone, but that production is exactly what has proven to destabilize the prosperity of societies, the conditions of habitabilities, and thus, of course, the conditions of subsistence of our societies. The decisive difference is here that societies can no longer be understood as surviving because of production. You can even say today that societies are beginning to survive despite 
or in spite of production. The production system has turned into a system of production that we each and every day when we open our newspaper, see, understand a little bit more, is threatening, threatening the continuous subsistence of societies. So once again, with Marx, all that is solid has melted into air. We are beginning to fathom, realize that society has another material basis, not based on production, but on a longer list of earthly processes, entities, living beings that allows the continuous survival of humans. And based on this material transformation, the class struggle, we argue, changed shape. Here is the essential difference. This is not simply a class struggle to take over the means of production, or for that matter, in the social democratic tradition, to find a more just distribution of the fruits of production. Instead, what we believe to see the first emerging contours of, as well as the need of making emerge, is an ecological class consisting of those who are fighting against production against the horizon of production, its practices, because of the destructive consequences that it has for the conditions of habitability. And who thus, therefore, neither can be identified inside or do identify themselves in a system of production. So while the old class struggle of the 19th and the 20th century were organized around the means of production, or the production forces, then the ecological class struggle of today is organized around the protection the securing, the maintenance of the earthly conditions of subsistence that allows the continuous reproductions of society. A struggle we try to delimit vaguely, but it's a front line we can say, between those who want to limit the practices of destruction, the practices of production, and those who want to expand them, keep on business as usual. So, this is exactly where we see, in our book, the potential for a collective, unified, political, ecological narrative. The possibility of a we, and the possibility of defining the direction of history. In the ruins of production, we see the first contours of, and the need of making, emerge, because it's always a performative argument when you speak about class, a well-defined we that is an ecological class. Point three. This was technical in more than one way. The indispensable cultural struggle for ideas. Let me sum up. The Green Party's political ecologists, the climate movements and so on, must accept that ecology is not a peace treaty, but a battle cry. It must, based on this, define a we, a them, and a vector of history. So, like Marx, who's, in my opinion, genius, lied in defining a people that corresponded to the social question of the 19th century, then today the question is, the necessity is, finding, constructing, building a people that matches the ecological question of the 21st century. And again, here we argue that one possibility, it's of course a hypothesis, is a well-defined ecological class united, assembled around its collective struggle against the expansion of production Again, people who are not fighting for the means of production, but against them. But simply identifying, positioning oneself along such objective lines of conflict is not, has not been and will never be enough. On the contrary, the Green Parties, the ecologists, would do well to remember that so-called objective class interests, objective interests in general, has never been sufficient for aligning people in struggles, for generating political ethics, and for making emerge a political mobilization. And certainly not to create a strong, infamous class consciousness. On the contrary, as social history has proven many times, you need a whole cultural catalog of concepts images, aesthetics, visions, narratives, if you want to create political ethics. Long before any class, <coughs> any party, any ideology can hope for gaining electoral successful results, 
voting support, you must participate in the cultural battle of ideas. Even if, or especially when, you have the catastrophe on your side. This is of course what Gramsci called the quest for hegemony, understood as the idea that long before you can hope to take over political power, you have to fight for cultural power. It would be an understatement to say that the Green parties have had a lot to offer here. The socialist, the liberalist, the illiberalist ideologies might be outdated, they might not be on par with the catastrophe that we are facing, but in turn, what they have, what their party candidates have, is a whole universe of ideas, concepts, values, images that they draw on to make their political projects desirable. The Green parties, on the other hand, seemed to have imagined that the catastrophe would be enough to gather effects. Think about it. I hope you will. Whenever a Green Party candidate appear on a TV political debate, they rarely offer any new narratives, any new concepts that could infuse their political projects with positive connotations. Instead, I must admit myself, they often receive themselves as looking regressive, panicky and uncomprehensive that people have not understood the catastrophe, making them also seem moralist. But, ladies and gentlemen, panic is tiring and necessity is boring. To vote is about choosing, it's about wanting to choose. And who wants to vote for a party that you must vote for, for the sake of the planet's survival, or that you should vote for, for moral reasons? 5% in France and 3% in Denmark. So to sum up, it strikes me, it strikes us in the book that one of the other reasons that political ecology has not managed to make emerge political ethics is because they have largely neglected the cultural struggle. Instead, they thought, and now my friend Louisa will be angry at me, that they could rest on cold facts about the coming disaster and soak them in moralism. Not you, she's very good. She's my, yeah, anyways. But as the book of Proverbs 27, 12 taught us, the prudent sees danger and he hides himself. Much rather than relying on Hüldelin's own quip, old kip, sentence, dictum, that where danger is also grow the saving power, the ecologist should have been following artist Jenny Hulse's advice that lack of charisma can be fatal. Because this certainly also is the case in politics. So, as indicated, the concrete antidote to this deficit of political ethics would be to take seriously, as people are now beginning, I, I believe, the necessity of constructing from below, from scratch, a whole cultural archive, register, universe, catalogue of ecological ideas, ecological images, aesthetics, visions, narratives that can allow political ecology to be imbued, infused with positive conversations, that can touch political souls. Politics has always been about ethics, it's always been about aesthetics. And it's only when such a register is at hand, I believe, that ecology can create an enthusiasm and where people can begin mirroring themselves in political ecology. Only then can ecology create a strong we and only then can it begin to compare on equal terms with the old ideologies that do continue to define the political landscape. So, to sum up today's lecture, three points for the Green parties to remember. If ecology wants to compete on equal footing with the old ideologies, first, it must accept that ecology is about conflict, it divides us. From this, from a description of these conflicts, it must create a strong we. And thirdly, the struggle must be cultural. 
And of course, what I hope, since we are here today in a cultural factory, if I understood, <laughs> is that the third point clarifies that the artistic domains, that the cultural domains, domains have an enormous responsibility to create a response ability, an ability to respond to this situation. Exactly because their work has always dealt with making people sense, feel, touch what they were not touched of or by before. So, my final battle cry here today in Berlin. For the Green Parties, the climate movement, to join forces with those cultural and artistic domains that know how to touch people. And for this army of culture, of art, the captains and colonels to come to the aid of ecologists and their desperate efforts by offering what they have always offered, a redistribution of ethics and sensibilities. Because a crisis of sensibilities is certainly what we find ourselves in. And if we face that, if we don't face that, whether we do or not, safeguarding the planet's conditions of habitability probably depend on it. Thank you very much.